working on grading the test. The TA is just really kind of overwhelmed. It's not fair for him or for you guys to have one TA for 85 students. So I told him to work on the exams first and then worry about the MATLAB homework second. So the MATLAB homework might take a while to get back. But I figure you'd rather have feedback on the test, right, than the MATLAB homework. So, um, And then there's one last MATLAB homework that I think is assigned in about a week or less than a week. And he's got to work on that too, poor guy. Um, and then the last... Um, day of class those projects are due. They're just like the same kind of thing as you guys did last year, so you should be or last semester. So you should be somewhat familiar on how to do them. Okay? Don't wait until the last minute to do it. That won't be a good idea. All right? And let me see if there's anything else fascinating to say. Not really. Um, obviously I'm not going to get through all this today because this is a lecture that's really designed to be in a you know hour and fifteen minute class and we've got fifty minutes. Because today is Friday, right? Yeah. Okay. Making sure I'm on this right page. So I'll get started at least. And then you do have a written homework. Was that given today, I think, right? And then you, you know how the written homeworks do. Unfortunately, we don't grade them, which I know is a problem, but you should still try to do it. And it's, it's up there, so you can take a look at it. All right. So um, we're a little bit behind the intended schedule, but today I will s introduce the concept which we talked about like the very first day of class, but not much since then, of something called feed-forward control. And I'm going to introduce the concept, obviously. I will talk about the most common kind of feed-forward control, which is something called ratio control. And then unlike most of the techniques, in fact, all the techniques we talked about, feedback control, um, it's common to do feed-forward control both with steady-state models and dynamic models. So I'll talk about both of those. And then I'll discuss the combination of feedback and feed-forward, because this is the way you invariably do it. You don't do feed-forward by itself. Um, and then at the end, which we won't do today, but we'll do Tuesday, I guess I'll go through the, a little example from Simulink. All right. So we know this about feedback control. It's pretty much all we've studied, and hopefully you know these things. First of all, um, the nice thing about feedback control is you take corrective action. It doesn't matter what caused the disturbance or what the problem came from. You observe the outputs deviating from the set point, and you take action. So it's very flexible in that regard. Um, you don't need a lot of information to design the controller. Sometimes you barely need any, but you know, like an ultimate gain, for example, or ultimate period, or a first order plus time delay model, but not too much. And you find that PID control is extremely versatile. It almost always works. I think in industry it works like 85% of the time. And 15% of the time you have to do something more sophisticated, um, which I don't really think we have time to talk about in the class, but I'll probably mention it in the last few days what other options are available. So it, it works a lot. Okay. Okay, so what's the disadvantages? Well, the disadvantage here is associated with this, <laughs> is that you don't take corrective action until something's already gone wrong. Because there's no way to know a disturbance, for example, is coming to the system until you see the output deviating from the set point. If the system has a long time constant, like the distillation column in the lab, then it's going to take a long time to get it back to the steady state that you're interested in. Obviously, you have to measure the output that you want to control. Um, usually, this is okay for regulatory control, like pressure flow, temperature. Um, but if you want to do composition or something, this can be more problematic. Even if you have a measurement of the disturbance, you have no way of using it. So if you have a column, you're trying to control compositions, overhead or bottoms. You, you measure the feed flow. You see the feed flow changes. Obviously, that's going to change the compositions in some predictable way. But um, with feedback control alone, there's no way to incorporate the knowledge of what that disturbance is. So that's not good. And we already know that the, the key, one of the key determinants here is, um, you know, if someone said, is it hard to do feedback control, but you would tend to look at these two things. What is tau? You know, tau is the dominant time constant of the process. If tau is long, then the system tends to respond very slowly, and feedback control is going to inherently be slow. Because you remember, even when we, d when we talked about doing um, things like direct synthesis and IMC, I told you reasonable things to make the closed loop time constant one half the open loop one. So if the open loop time constant is, is two hours, you know, you can make the system be a little bit faster, but not a lot. It's still going to be slow. And then we know it's, it's hard to control a system where the theta is, is uh, over tau ratio is large. So if you have a time delay that's five minutes and the time constant is ten minutes, this is going to cause problems for control. Okay. All right. So, you know, we like feedback control, but it's not, it's not a panacea, let's say. So there's other things we could think about doing, and one of them is this idea of feed-forward control. 
We'll talk about another thing um, starting on Tuesday. I guess it'll be cascade control. All right, so the idea here is that here's our typical feedback control, right? So you have an output, you measure this thing, you compare it to the set point, you adjust some input, right? It's all based on measuring the output you want to control. Feed forward control is all about measuring the disturbance you think is causing the problem, okay? So how does feedback control work? Well, the disturbance effect system caused the output to deviate from the set point. You start reacting. In this case, we'll do something fundamentally different. We'll try to measure the disturbance and then we'll try to counteract the, the effect of the disturbance right away instead of waiting for it to deviate. So in some sense, you could, you could think of this as we're trying to generate a signal here that'll cancel the effect of the disturbance through here, right? So um, hopefully, if all goes well, this disturbance will have little or no effect on the output here, okay? So measure the disturbance instead of the controlled output. That's the difference here. So what's the good about this? Well. The good thing is, in principle, you can take corrective action before the disturbance ever affects the system. So if this is a column, and this is the feed flow to the column, then you can start thinking about adjusting the reflux ratio or reboiler rate or whatever you want to manipulate um, as soon as you measure there's a change in feed flow. Not, not until you see compositions deviating at the top of the, or bottom of the column. So that would be a lot faster, in principle. And it's particularly useful, well, for systems like over there. Things that have large time constants or large time delays, this will tend to be very beneficial. Okay, to do this, um, obviously you have to measure the disturbance, right? Um, and so for some disturbances, this will be really pretty reasonable, like feed flow. If it starts to be composition of the, fl of the feed stream to the column, um, you can do that, of course, but you'll have to explain to somebody why you want to do it, and you have to pay for it. So. Um, you do have to justify the measurements you want to put in, so any disturbance you want to do this with, you have to be able to measure. The, the main problem with this is you can't measure all the disturbances in a plant. Okay. So if you have a column, and a column, you know, let's say the composition at the bottom of the column deviates from the set point, I can't even begin to tell you how many possible causes could do that in the column. Okay. Feed flow. You know, heat exchanger fouling, um, day-night temperature variations. I mean, it's just a, innumerable in a sense. And so there's no way to measure all these disturbances. So what you're trying to do here is just pick out the disturbance that you think is the most prevalent, causes the most problems, okay? Um, and typically, this requires a model to do this. We'll talk a little bit about that, okay? So ultimately, what we're going to do is combine these two. So we'll have a feed-forward controller and a feedback controller, put them together, and then in some sense, we'll get the best of all worlds. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, so this is a boiler drum. So the idea here is you're creating steam, and then the steam is used downstream for other things, such as heat exchangers or something like this, heat exchange networks. And so this would be a typical way of doing control, right? So what do we want to do? We want to control the level in the drum. Why? Because we don't want to run out of inventory in the drum so we can create steam. So this would be a typical feedback controller, right? You measure the level send it to a controller, compare it to some set point, gen change the amount of water being fed into this drum. So if you see the level dropping, then you, then you feed in more, okay? So this, so the question is why would the level drop in the first place? Well, the level's gonna drop because the steam demand's gonna change. So if this steam is used by a variety of different unit operations, then the demand's gonna go up and down, and the level's gonna go up and down accordingly. You guys have done heat exchanger networks, right? Okay. So if you have a steam heat exchanger, steam has to come from somewhere. Okay. So if you've got a lot of steam heat exchangers, then depending on how the plant's being operated, this demand might be low or it might be high, but in any event, it's going to vary. And that, therefore, the level's going to vary. And if this system has a, a long time constant, in other words, the flow you can put in here is small relative to the inventory of the tank, this level might wander around a lot. Okay. So an alternative strategy is this. This is a feed-forward controller. So instead of trying to measure the level directly, you just measure the um, amount of steam being used, okay? Because you know if more steam is being used, the level will drop, right? So this will be a faster measurement of what's happening than the level itself. You can compensate more quickly, okay? So measure the steam. Send that to something called a feed-forward controller, which you have no idea what this is right now, but I'll explain it to you. Um, and then adjust the feed rate accordingly. So in other words, you're trying to balance the steam demand. If more steam is being used, put more water in to compensate for it. It'll, it'll give you a better level of control in principle than this will. Okay? 
And ultimately, you want to do something like this. So what is this good for? This is really good if the steam demand changes. Okay? What is this good for? Everything else. Anything else that must, might cause the um, level to change from its set point, like you know, changes in the heat transfer here, changes in the um, temperature of the feed, or anything else that might happen. So what you can do here is combine the two. So if you want to control the level, you have this feed forward controller, right? It measures the steam demand. Then you have your feedback control that measures the level. And then the output of the controller, you sum the output of two controllers. So this is the feedback controller. It's nothing but that thing, picture there. And this is the feed forward controller, which is nothing but that. So the signal you send to the valve is just the sum of the two controllers. So this will, co this will compensate for change in steam demand, this for everything else. So that's ultimately what we'll do. But for now, we're really going to focus on why we, how and why we want to do this feed forward control. All right. So this is by far the most common type of feed forward control, ratio control. So here's some examples. So this is where you just want to maintain the ratio of two streams at some constant value or some d specified value. Okay. We write it like this. There's a sum of two, uh, ratio of two flows. You have one flow that you manipulate, and then you have another flow that you can measure its flow, but you don't manipulate it. So let me see if I have a decent picture here. Okay. It'd be something like this. Okay. You have two flows. You want to keep a ratio of these two flows. And therefore, um, one of them you actually manipulate. The other one, you just measure the flow. You don't manipulate it. But you just, so you measure the flow of this one. You manipulate this one. So the flow remains, the ratio remains the same. So it's not very complex. So measure disturbance flow, manipulated flow is you. Here's some examples that I've, I assume you've seen some of these type of things before. Um, so if you're blending two things, you might want to have a stoichiometric ratio of the two components that you're blending together. Same thing if you're doing r a reactor. You might want to have some stoichiometric ratio of the two reactants to a reactor because you know what the stoichiometry of <laughs> the reaction is. Or you might want to maintain a stoichiometry of one component over the other to accelerate the reaction. Reflux ratio is inherently a ratio of two flows, right? Um, in a distillation column, and also if you're doing some kind of combustion process or something in a furnace, you might want to have some desired ratio of the fuel to the air to get a, a efficient combustion. So this is, you know, that works pretty well. Okay. All right. Um, so these are just some examples where you might want to maintain a ratio of two flows. So it's pretty common, very, actually very common in a, you would see this. Okay. So there's two ways to do this. The way that um, is most obvious but has some problem associated with it, and then, the pro and then the way that's maybe not so obvious but is better for implementation purposes. So I already showed you this picture. Hopefully this makes sense to you. I have s two streams here. I want to maintain a constant ratio or a specified ratio of these two. So what's the logical thing? We'll measure each flow, compute the ratio of the two flows, Compare that ratio to what you want the ratio to be, and then adjust this flow accordingly. So it's not very complex, right? Um, the problem with this is if you look at what the ratio is, we've defined the ratio here to be um, okay. So it's the flow you manipulate divided by the flow you measure, but don't manipulate, and. So I, guess, I don't know if we've really talked about this, but if I wanted to know what the, so this is my output, right, R. It's the thing I want to control. And U is my input, the thing I want to manipulate. And so, right, when we have a transfer function, we write this like this. And then I told you, if you're ever interested in getting the gain of the process, you can just set s equal to 0, right? And that always gives you the process gain. So at steady state, y equals k times u. All right? Um, and so in this particular case, um, k, you can think of it as being 1 over d. That's basically what I'm doing here. I'm just I'm just saying, generally speaking, if you want to know the gain and you have an algebraic relationship, you can take the derivative of y with respect to u, and that'll give you the gain. But you can get the same answer over here, okay? Because um, 
in this particular, the gain is just 1 over d. So if d changes a lot, right, so if sometimes d is, is 0.1, then this gain is 10. If sometimes it's, it's 10, it's 0.1. So if this disturbance flow changes a lot, then um, this effective process gain changes a lot. And we don't talk too much about this in the course. We probably should. But if you have a process where the gain changes a lot, it's really hard to design a controller that works. Because right, we usually want to take the controller gain in the chaga. We like to take the controller gain to be kind of inversely proportional to the process gain, right? If you look at all the tuning formulas, they're always involved 1 over k of the process. So if the process gain changes a lot, the controller gain should change a lot. So the idea of this, or the problem with this, is that large changes in the disturbance flow will cause large changes in the process gain, which will cause your controller to be poorly tuned. Okay? So even though this is the simplest way to think about doing it, it's not the way people tend to actually implement it. They do it with this, this method over here. Okay? This is something called a ratio station. So this is an explicit calculation. This is an implicit method of um, implementing the controller. So the way this works is measure the flow of the disturbance um, stream. Send it through something called the ratio station. Exciting. I'll explain what that is in a minute. That generates a set point, and then you just control this flow with a feedback controller. So the key thing is how do you generate this set point? Um, and you do this with this, this, this gain here. So this ratio station is nothing but this simple calculation here. It involves what you would like the, the ratio to be, and then to compensate for the fact that the, measure, the measurement devices might have different spans. You remember what a span is? That's like minimum, maximum value. So like 0 to 10 kilograms per minute or 0 to 20. So this just compensates for the fact they might have different um, spans or um, ranges over which they measure. So the idea of this is you calculate um, a value here that as long as this controller drives the, this flow to this set point, then you'll get the ratio that you want. Okay? And the advantage of doing it this way is you don't have to do this type of implementation, so you don't have this, this is a problem with nonlinearity. So that, that is eliminated. Okay? So I mean, this is not critical for our purposes, but if you go into a plant, um, this would all, I mean, for the most part, this would be hidden under the hood of the distributed control system, but this is how it would actually be implemented. Okay. So I, I never know what examples you guys do, but um, in your other classes, I don't know if you've ever talked about how you make ammonia, but you make ammonia by reacting hydrogen and nitrogen together. So I don't know if you've done this in some reaction engineering class or something like that. All right, so we, um, all right, so we want to make um, ammonia. So we have a reactor that makes ammonia. Well, there's some, I don't even know what the stoichiometry, I guess you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what the stoichiometry probably is here. Okay. Um, I'm too tired to do it, though, to be honest. Because I didn't fl I flew into Hartford last night, 2 in the morning. So I'm just going on autopilot right now. All right, so we have two flows here. We have a hydrogen flow. We have a nitrogen flow. We want to maintain some stoichiometry between these for the synthesis reaction. Uh, we're going to manipulate explicitly the nitrogen flow. We're going to measure the flow of the hydrogen. Okay. So this just gives a more explicit idea of how this ratio station idea is implemented. Okay. So we take the flow of, um, of hydrogen here. We, now this, is this is done a little bit differently than the picture I showed, but that's all right. All right, so if we look at this, we see we have two flow control loops, right? We have one flow control loop for the, uh, for the hydrogen, and then we have another flow control loop for the, uh, one for the hydrogen, one for the nitrogen, okay? All right, so that's a little bit different than I showed you over here, right? Because there was no flow loop up here. That's, that's the way the book seems to like to do things. All right, that's fine. Um, so in pr what you would probably want to do, if you had a system like this, and you want to do control, you would have two flow controllers. One flow, this would be manipulated to maintain the ratio, and this would be manipulated to control the production rate, right? So if you want to make so much ammonia, you would decide how much ammonia you're going to make with this hydrogen flow, and then you'd make sure the nitrogen flow is in the right stoichiometric ratio compared to the hydrogen flow. So that's why this makes sense, even though it's inconsistent with the other picture. So just think of, in this case, I, I would specify a set point here for the hydrogen flow that would determine the production rate of ammonia. And then this, the rest of this makes sure that the nitrogen flow, it has the right ratio, stoichiometric ratio, to the hydrogen flow. 
Okay. All right. Okay, so if if you were in industry doing one of these type of controllers, it's not unusual that you would um, base this feed forward control on a steady state model. This might seem a little weird because the whole class has been focused on dynamics and how to use dynamic models to build and analyze control systems. Uh, the reasoning is, and I I know you get mad when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Of course, I don't know where I'm going. Okay. So take a look at this picture, because ultimately this is how you're going to implement this, right? You're going to design a feedback controller, a feedforward controller, and then you're going to put them together, okay? So uh, there are dynamic ways to design this feedforward controller I'll talk about, but let's just say this was based on a steady state model, which we normally would never do with a feedback controller. The idea here is that because you still have a feedback controller, this can just take care of the steady state. So in other words, what do I want to do? I want to eliminate the effect of steam demand changes on the level. Let's say I do the design just based on a steady state model, then really what I'm saying is I just want to eliminate the effects at steady state. Okay, so I'm not taking a account of dynamics at all. It might seem a little bit strange, but as long as you're implementing a feedback controller, whatever this thing doesn't do, this one will, and this will take care of the dynamic part. Okay, so think about it that way. It kind of makes sense. And so I'll talk first of all about the steady state design problem Via, via some examples, then we'll talk more generally about the dynamic problem. But okay, let's say you have a column. I'm sure you guys have had your fill of columns at this point. When is your design project due, by the way? What? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought I heard. Um, December 8th. So oh, that's because you have no final exam, is that the idea? All right. I don't think you're supposed to make things due during finals week, but that's not my call. Okay. So let's just, let's just say this. You do have a design project. Just verify this. <laughs> okay. And your design project is some plant design problem of which invariably involves dist multiple distillation columns or something like this. Is that correct? Okay. And you're trying to use Aspen to do this, but you don't know how to use Aspen, so it's very hard. <laughs> All right. So I see we're teaching the class like we always did. Great. All right. Um, all right. So you, you know all about distillation now, uh, or at least as much as, as you want to know. So, so this is how we do distillation, right? Let's just assume we have binary distillation to make life easy. Introduce a feed at certain flow, a certain composition, let's say the more volatile component, right? Equilibrium stages, put vapor up, liquid down. A more volatile component accumulates up here, less volatile at the bottom. Um, I don't, I assume you've written out balance. You must, you had to do something like this, just do McCabe Thiele when you did that in separations. But this is just steady state mass balances about the column, right? So this is an overall mass balance. This could be a molar basis or a mass basis because there's no reaction, doesn't make any difference. So, right, the flow in has to equal the sum of the two flows out. Nothing very exciting there. Because this is a, bi I'm assuming binary, we just need one component balance. Because right, we have an overall and then one component balance, and this is just a balance on the more volatile component, let's say. So no dynamics, just steady state here. All right. So now, for reasons I'm going to explain in a minute, I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to solve it for the distillate flow, right? So first of all, I can take this equation, eliminate B, plug in, you know, B equal what? F minus D down here, solve the resulting equation for D. So it's not, it's not too complicated. So now what I'm proposing is I would like to use this equation to design a, uh, a feed-forward controller. So what's the feed-forward control problem? Well, um, the idea here is I anticipate that the feed flow will change and the feed composition might change. And I would like to adjust the distillate flow to compensate for that. And what I really want to do, according to what I got down here, is um, I want to control the do my best to, to do this so I can keep the bottoms and top compositions on some target specifications here. Okay. So this is a pretty common way to do the steady state design. You take steady state balance equations, combine them, get an equation like this, and then you convert it into a controller. And this explains how this conversion is done. Okay. So first of all, why did I solve it for D? Because D is the manipulated variable. It's what I'm going to change in order to do the feed forward controller. It's the input. 
Now, if I look at the right-hand side, anywhere on the right-hand side that I have a measurement, I'm going to use the measurement. So I'm assuming here I have a flow measurement of the feed, and I have a um, me composition measurement of the feed. Okay, that's why I put those. Those are two measurements, okay? Now, this is a little bit strange, but this is the way the book does it, so I stuck with it. Um, let's say I do not have measurements of either the distillate or bottoms composition, okay? So I have to use something in here for these things. So what do I plug in? I plug in what I wish those values were, the set points for those. So in other words, if you have a measurement, use it. If you don't have a measurement, use the set point for that thing. And if you don't have, the, and then if you don't have either of those, you just use what I call a nominal value, which we don't have in this case. Okay. So right, there's measurement of flow, measurement of composition. I don't have measurements of either top or uh, bottoms composition, so I just use the target values for the compositions there. Okay? So what's this controller supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to say, if there's a change in feed flow or feed composition, I will change the distillate flow rate automatically such that I'll try to compensate for that. And I'll try to keep the two compositions at the bottom and the top near the set points. It won't do it perfectly, and it won't account for dynamics at all, but it will. Yeah, so the way to think about this is like it's a pr preemptive strike. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but you, you anticipate, and you know actually from this equation, that if, these two, if the flow changes or the composition changes, that's going to cause these two compositions to deviate from their set points. Rather than wait for this change to propagate through the column and end up at the top or the bottom and then s screw up the compositions, you try to mitigate the effect right away. It won't be perfect. It won't be complete but it will go a long way so to eliminating these effects, okay? So I think we have another example here. So what is this one? Blending system. So we got, right, two streams, want to blend them together and get a desired composition, I would assume, okay? So the problem is maintain the composition coming out at some set point, and what do we think the problem here is? We think the problem might be that the composition of this stream might change. So the way to think about it, this stream we control, at least the flow, this stream we have no control over. Okay? So this is coming forward, we're trying to blend it with the stream we have control of the flow of and get a composition coming out that we like. Okay? Now you might imagine here that, let's just say the system is operating like you want, the composition's at the set point, and now the composition of the feed changes, that's going to screw things up. Right? So the composition here goes up, eventually the composition here will be too high. So rather than wait for all this mixing to take place, right, because this has some dynamics, right, it's a stirred tank. So rather than wait for this dynamics to take place and then start observing that this is not at the set point, let's just compensate right away, okay? So to do this, you have to be able to measure the composition. So what this picture says, measure composition, send this to a controller, which I'm about to give you the equation for, and then manipulate this flow accordingly, all right? I'm feeling really tired. If I fall over, class is dismissed, okay? <laughs> All right. Now I've got a subset. I'd like to think a subset that wants me to fall over, not a majority. But it, it could be a majority. Um, so what are we going to do? To do this, we'll write just kind of the same thing we did to the distillation column. I'll write steady state mass balances, right? And this is going back to like 110 or 120 or whatever. Um, I'm not even sure what you guys do in 110, but at least goes back to 120. All right. So, so this is overall mass balance, right? It just says the flow coming out is equal to the sum of the two flows coming in. No big deal. And then this is a, um, th I'm assuming this is a binary mixture. Okay, so this is, the, this is one of the two components, right? It's the mass fraction or mole fraction, depending if these are mass flow rates or molar flow rates. So that's the amount coming out, and that's the, the amount coming in, right? So everyone, I think, <laughs> no problem here. So what am I going to do when I'm going to take this equation? I'm going to solve it for W2, right? Because W2 is the thing I'm going to manipulate, just like D was in the previous case. So take this equation, eliminate W, looks like I did. Um, plug it into this equation and um, solve the resulting equation for W2, okay? In terms of W1 and everything else. So now we get this equation. So now we do the same thing. It, so this is our, we're going to use this thing to design a feed-forward controller. So what we're going to do is anytime we have a measurement, we're going to use the measurement that's available to us. And you can see we explicitly have a measurement of the composition of that stream. That's the whole point. So that's that right there. Okay? If you look at the picture, we don't have a measurement of much of anything else. So 
Um, for example, I don't have a measurement of x, but I know what I'd like x to be. I'd like it to be the set point, so I plug in those values there. Okay? I don't have a measurement of x2, and I don't have a desired value of x2, so I just plug what x2 normally is, you know, some like nominal value. Like the composition of this stream is either known or normally known. And the same thing with w1. Okay? So you can prove, it's not hard, that if the flow rate is exactly that, the w1 flow rate is exactly that, and the composition of the stream x2 is exactly that, then this controller will totally wipe out the effect of this composition change at steady state. You just need to plug the thing back in. It's not hard to see. Okay. Um, if that's not the correct flow or, or that's not the right composition, it won't do it perfectly, but it'll do it okay. okay. All right, and this little picture over here is just an implementation issue. So it, you'll never see something that looks exactly like this. So you never see a controller. So this is a flow control problem. 90% of the problems you see in industry with controller, you, control, you manipulate a flow. So what this thing says is I'm going to send the signal directly to the valve. Okay? You never do that. You always send, so if you, you want to control a flow, you always have a flow control loop like this. Okay? You want to control this flow, what do you do? Measure the flow, have a valve, and then have a controller that establishes whatever flow you want. That's different than adjusting the valve position directly. Okay? And so rather than this controller sending a signal directly to the valve, it'll send a con signal to, to establish the set point for this flow controller. This is, this is also known as cascade control. We'll talk more about it. But anytime you talk about flow, you want to control a flow, you always have an inner flow control that actually establishes the flow you want. Okay. All right. What do we have next here? Okay, so that's it for, for steady state. You get the idea. You write out steady state mass balances, plug in measurements where you have them available. If you don't have them available, um, plug in either set points or nominal values, come up with a controller. Okay, so what's the problem with this? Well, certainly one problem in the major problem is this doesn't account for dynamics whatsoever. Just it's all steady state considerations, which I tried to explain. Could make sense, but you'd rather have something more general. And so to do that, we can do dynamic control. All right, so this is the block diagram. It's a modification of the one you've seen before, but it's not radically different. The different part is up here, which I'll get to, but otherwise looks the same, right? Take, a me take the output, measure it, compare it to the set point in the same units, generate an error, it's operate on that with a controller, send that signal to a valve. Valve establishes, let's say, a flow that goes into the process to do control. We have a disturbance that enters up here. And so the idea of this feed-forward controller, so this is the new part up here. To implement a feed-forward controller, what we're going to do is the following. First of all, we're going to measure the disturbance. That's what this thing is. We're going to send that disturbance something called the feed-forward controller. And then the signal being sent to the valve is going to be the sum of what comes from the feedback controller and that that comes from the feed-forward controller. Okay? Okay. So the new part is this up here. That's the only thing new here. And in principle, the idea here is that we're going to try to design this controller. So if you look at this disturbance, what does it do? It propagates through this transfer function and then, generally speaking, screws up the output. So what we'd like to do is calculate a controller here so that when the disturbance propagates through this pathway, it exactly cancels. So you want, you understand, you'd like the disturbance going through here to be canceled by a signal you've created right here. And if you do, then you wipe out the effect of the disturbance completely. Okay, so um, all we're talking about now is how to design the feed forward controller, not.